Julie Wen. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am very, very well. Thank you so much for asking. I'm excited about our conversation. Looking forward to getting in it. And before we do, can you give me a little context about who you are and what it is that you do? I'm Dr. Julie Went, so I'm an allergist immunologist, and I've been practicing for years and years, since 2000. And I see both children and adults, pretty much everyone, board certified in allergy immunology as well as internal medicine and obesity medicine. So I've run the gamut of what I do, and I run an allergy practice in North Scottsdale, Arizona, and I've done so for about five years after working for a number of other different groups, and I enjoy it immensely. One of my greatest joys is to help people and to educate people, and I wrote a book, What's Eating Our Kids, A Parent's Guide to Food Allergy Intolerance and Toxicity because I see a lot of patients with food allergy as well as intolerance. And then the curiosity about tic- toxicity, which I seek far less that's uh, obvious, although I do suspect that our food supply is slowly but surely becoming a source of that. So I endeavored to write a book and I hope that I can help more than just my patient area in North Scottsdale. Yeah, absolutely. And what took you down that route in the first place of going down the route of allergies, intolerances, toxicity, etc.? I see all forms of allergy and there's so many so many different options for patient nowadays. Uh, it used to be a mantra of if you're allergic, avoid it. And that's about all we could do with food. And then give people treatments to carry with them like EpiPen, which is the antidote for a severe allergic reaction known as anaphylaxis. And other than that, and educating people about what other things could be an obstacle for them or cross-reactivity, we have so much more nowadays like food oral immunotherapy, But we also have a lot of people that come in and think they're allergic, but are just really having trouble tolerating food. And I see that at least one to two new patients a day in that area. And I want to help people understand the difference. I think that the way that we've tested and treated people as allergists has changed largely because of the pressure to over-test and attribute everything to allergy when it's not. And the treatment is distinctly different. And I feel that as well. And I just really wanted to elucidate what is really going on and what the proper modality is in terms of what should the investigation look like and what should the treatment look like. Absolutely. So yeah, let's get to the very, very foundations of it all. And what is it about food allergies that maybe we're getting wrong that you want people to be more aware of? So there is multitude of types of allergies. And I love that people come to me as an allergist, as an authority on food allergies. There's a lot of things that are gotten wrong. I don't think the hour is going to be able to cut it. But I think I would say, first and foremost, and the take home message should be if people think that they're having a food allergy or their children are having a food allergy, go see a board certified allergist immunologist, or I think where you're from, an allergologist, um, because those are truly the expert on whether it is an allergy or not. And hopefully you find one that also is collaborative with the patient. So I never like to tell the patient, what I think is going wrong. I want them to tell me their story. And then when I've heard everything, seen everything and done my testing, I want to make that expert opinion and educate them as well. So let me just give an idea of what, and this is a Cliff Notes definition. So, you know, typically There's not one type of allergy. There's immediate allergy and a delayed type allergy. And there's actually two other allergies. But food allergy is, generally speaking, an immediate type allergy where symptoms occur immediately. And we see symptoms, anything from hay fever type symptoms, post-nasal drip, runny nose, itchy red, runny eyes, itchy skin, 
hives, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, swelling of the throat or tongue, rashes, you know, and it can progress to unfortunately death. And so it can be very quick. And so we call that an immediate allergy. A delayed type allergy, I always summarize it as in it kills you slowly, which is unfortunate, but true. So characteristic food allergies that can have a delayed component are celiac disease, where someone can actually suffer with it for a long time, really have a hard time and not get answers, but not not die of it that immediately in contrast to the immediate type allergy. Another type of allergy that can be delayed is eczema, although eczema can also be very confusing because it can be immediate too. So you can have immediate, you can have delayed. Delayed is significantly harder to differentiate and, and figure out for patients as well as physicians because I don't know if you even remember what you had for breakfast yesterday or the day before or a week ago or what you might have snacked on all throughout the day, but that's that's the type of scenario that we're talking about is, wow, I didn't have this, you know, I only have this once or twice a month. Well, that could also be a delayed allergy. There's contact allergies where there's an issue in the area of contact, and that also can include intestine. The intestine can have that as well. And then there's intolerance, which is an entirely different issue. So intolerance is basically a issue due to lack of digestion or absorption out of proportion to what is consumed. So if you consume it in smaller amounts, it's fine. But then if you get out of proportion to what can be broken down and actually absorbed, then you start having issues. Some components of irritable bowel syndrome are actually intolerance. Lactose intolerance is an, another type of intolerance. And there's all sorts of intolerances. I think the FODMAPs have come into play recently. They've gotten a lot of press and I, I love that they do because they address a lot of concerns if used properly, the FODMAP diet and have helped a lot of people, but there's others as well. So that's an example of intolerance. And Typically, the symptoms are that I see very commonly in clinic are diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, and bloating. And I'm talking, it could be anything from a little, like I, I just don't feel normal, or you know, I look at myself in the mirror and it's not the same as when I woke up this morning, to I look pregnant after I eat. Very discouraging for people and very uncomfortable, really almost painful for some people. And then there's toxicity. And my next book is going to highlight this a little bit more because I'm becoming, as an allergist, I'm becoming a bigger and bigger advocate of the environment and what we do to our food supply and what we're doing to ourselves really as well. One issue is that our food supply is different. And if you look at the people that make our food, they're in the business of selling the food, of course, and they're doing a great job. They know how to get us to eat, right? We love fat, we love sugar, we love carbohydrates, and you know, together it's even better. You know, one of the things that my daughter, in the process of writing this book, pointed out to me, and she's a environmental engineer, is that, you know, when you have a food, even of intolerance, for example, if it goes right through you and isn't absorbed and doesn't give you any calories, you're going to have all these miserable symptoms, but then you're going to need to eat more because it's not going to be absorbed and you're not going to actually get the nutritional value of it. We have really forsaken the fundamental nutrients for convenience and for processed food. And I'm going to be the last one to criticize anyone, especially mothers, because I'm a mother and I've gone this route too. And more recently, now I have a little bit more time on my hands. Most of my children are grown up. We just have one little, one little straggler hanging in for a few more years. But I've, 
I've tried to go back to the organic foods. And if you can see it and identify it as a food, that's what it is, as opposed to the, I'm going to pour it in a bowl or eat the bar or, you know, very easy, easy and convenient and quick. And I totally understand that. And some of the things that, but, but we also, from ground to harvesting to table, there's a lot of things that make it into our diet. And there's so many new health problems that I can't, I see them starting to, what I believe and suspect strongly, that's finally having an impact. Like the concentration is, is finally getting to be too much. And the more we do this, the worse it's going to be. And I totally understand why. It's because we, at least here in America, our, you know, our farms and our produce are trying to, to create large amounts of food supply for a large amount of people. And so we've created efficiencies. And sometimes they're in farming and they're benign you know, to the way we harvest, maybe they're even better because things are fresher for us, but also they're in the form of like pesticides and herbicides and things like this. And, you know, there's all these brilliant people that create all these great efficiencies and, and in the form of chemicals and whatnot. But it takes us like 20 years or more to figure out that they're a problem and that they cause cancer and, you know, some people are affected, others aren't at the amounts that we're seeing now. But the, the more and more we do this, the more and more we're going to start having issues. And so I wanted to address that topic as well, because I think we need to take back our environment and really start eating healthier, more organic, more natural and less of the processed food and the ultra processed food that's making its way into our diet. Yeah, absolutely. And I would love to get onto that food toxicity part in just a moment. But before we do, I want to stay on the intolerances and the allergies as well. And I can imagine there's a bit of a crossover with the symptoms as well that we're experiencing. I can imagine that, you know, if we're getting a little bit of bloating, we might even be getting some of those hay fever flu-like symptoms as well and there might be a crossover between the symptoms of having an intolerance and an allergy and or an allergy with that being said are the solutions the same obviously you mentioned that in the past it was just a sense of okay if you're allergic to that you don't have it what are some of the solutions these days to both allergies and intolerances other than just avoid it or is that even still a good piece of advice maybe it's a bit outdated but is it still valuable advice Right. Well, it can be valuable advice in the absence of a better solution. Again, you know, the food oral immunotherapy is, I don't know if you're experienced with allergy shots or if you're aware of them, but that's the common modality that allergists have that helps them become, people become accustomed to the environment. And basically we have that for food allergies, not in the form of a shot, but we basically can help patients consume what they're potentially deathly allergic to. And while I would be reluctant to say someone can just eat it freely without being mindful, at least people can accidentally ingest it. And the idea behind it is that accidental ingestion will not result in death. Or if there is an allergic reaction, it would be less severe than it was when you started the process. And so that's the goal of it. Although I will say that uh, my fellow allergists with which I correspond have had a number of patients that actually can get to the point of free eating. And that's amazing when you don't have to be mindful anymore. So that involves starting the process below the allergic threshold for most patients, and then slowly building up over time. And what we're doing behind the scenes is we're building up the regulatory cells that inhibit the allergic cells. We never really want to kill off the allergic cells. They have, believe it or not, important functions in our body, like combating certain diseases, combating parasites. Here in Arizona, they help in the immune process 
to defend us against valley fever. We don't want to get rid of them, but we want to reduce their overreactivity. We call it hypersensitivity. So a food isn't supposed to kill you, right? You know, other than an allergic reaction, when did an apple hurt anybody? So the idea is to tame the immune response and teach it by regular low level stimulation that the substance is benign and not going to hurt them. And that's what we do by increasing those regulatory cells that inhibit the allergic cells naturally. And unfortunately, it's a slow process because allergy is the default mechanism of the immune response. We, that's why we can test it in the office with what we call a skin testing. We know in 20 minutes what you're allergic to and what you're not is because the allergy cells are awake and ready to spring into action at any time. They also are underneath the skin, around the vital organs and around the blood vessels. So they can literally inject their nasty chemicals into the blood supply immediately and have an immediate impact. And so, you know, we have to be very careful to activate the regulatory cells and not activate the allergy cells at the same time while we're doing this. So it's a process that is best left to boards certified allergists, immunologists, and allergologists. And then intolerance has, but of course I will back up and say, not everyone wants to take me up on that. And so, you know, there's always room for complete avoidance, and that's the other very appropriate treatment. But if that's the case, we always arm someone with a anaphylaxis action plan, so what to do if you do get, get into the situation where you accidentally ingested someone, you know, your kid's best friend gave them said something and said, no, there's no nuts in it, but they don't know. and then they eat it and then they're in a bad situation. And how to, you know, an epinephrine auto injector, how to use it, that sort of thing. What other action to take if they get into that situation or if for some reason they're not a candidate to use an epinephrine pen, what alternatives there are for them. And so that's the fundamental treatment of food allergy in a nutshell. In terms of intolerance, we don't wanna take food away from people, not, not completely. And especially a lot of the foods of intolerance might be very healthy foods, unfortunately. And so what we wanna do is we wanna figure out what the issue is, what they're not tolerating, and reduce consumption below the level at which their body, which is different for everyone, can digest and absorb and keep it below that and every now and then try and creep up for them so that they're not restricted and having a restrictive diet their entire life. I also really like to make sure that people are protecting their gut and taking care of their gut by making sure they have an excellent probiotic because this is the foundation of inflammation in the gut is what's going on on a baseline level. And we can actually make the situation better by helping diversify the microbiome and maybe pointing it in a good direction, or we could be making it worse. And a lot of the times, again, with the processed and ultra processed food, we're making it worse and we're actually contributing to this problem of intolerance. It's the bacteria in the gut that get that undigested product, whatever it is, in the colon and they digest it in a process known as fermentation. And that's where the bloating and the gas and the diarrhea and all the bad symptoms come from. So we, if we can modify the gut microbiome, which is our term for what lives in your gut on a regular basis, we can make it so much better. And so that is what I'm doing while I'm teaching people and 
walking through what their areas of intolerance are. Mm, yeah, I love that. And if someone is really not sure what is causing their bloating, their discomfort, they're aware it's not necessarily an allergy and it feels more like an intolerance to them, where do you go about them starting? Like you said, it's hard to know what we ate for breakfast last week and we might be consuming a variety of diverse different foods as we're recommended to to keep our gut nice and yeah the bacteria in our gut diversified and in a good place but obviously that comes with the other side of things of not knowing what might be causing those symptoms of bloating etc which is the most common one to be completely honest is the one that brings people's attention is digestion issues is bloating etc so when we get to that position how can we go about discovering exactly what that might be without you know going to see someone for example well i would say if someone you know me walking around the street what kind of advice i would give to someone that i think is pretty benign is attempt a, a really good high quality probiotic and i guess what i mean by that is one that's cared for well so you want to get it from a refrigerated section and, you know, around this local area, I like to go to Sprouts or Whole Foods. They take care of their probiotics like they take care of their produce. And that makes me happy. It's not stored on the shelf. And here in Arizona, like this summer, it was 120 degrees for, I think, all summer, actually. If you think about something in a storehouse that might have experienced that, you're not going to have bacteria live. And that is what is the key product. And you want as much of that to be alive as possible when it hits your gut or you're just wasting your money and you're going to think it doesn't work, which is probably true. So you want to make sure it's a high quality probiotic, that it's well used, that there's a lot of diversity. One of the things that I've started recommending to people is there's a few companies that are actually getting a fecal sample, which is it, you know, gives you the company an idea of what is in their gut. They culture it, they differentiate what is in the microbiome, and then they see, you know, this is this bacteria is good, this bacteria is associated with all these symptoms and makes it worse. You know, so maybe we can tailor make a, a probiotic in order to really dilute out, give more good that's going to be protective and reduce the bad. And so that's that's what I've been recommending. And it seems to be helpful for most of my patients. But, you know, to start, those tend to be much more expensive. And, you know, frankly, when you're having these symptoms and you can't even function, you can't go anywhere without planning out where the bathrooms are, or, you know, having a, a jacket so that you can unzip your pants or your skirt. I think it's worthwhile. So worth an extra change of clothes. But that being said, I, I start out with a, if you want, if that's a little beyond what your budget is, which I get, start with one of these refrigerated products and see if you can get luck from that. And then I recommend changing up every night now and then because diversity is something that's very important. If you if something hits your gut, like an antibiotic, it's going to kill the bacteria there. So you want a nice, diverse group of bacteria that can weather things that happen. You know, the infections you get, if you get COVID, if you have an antibiotic, if you accidentally eat something that's not right or you don't feel good or you're, you end up fasting for a day, you want... You want a bunch in there so that they can help you during all these seasons. Yeah. And do you recommend taking a probiotic at all times, like every single day around the year? Or do you recommend cycling on and off or it depends on the severity of your bloating, etc.? You know, for people with those gut symptoms, I would probably veer on the side of recommending it on a regular basis. I was reading an article the other day, and there's some of the very benevolent bacteria that are becoming extinct in our gut. And, you know, we really don't think about that. We think about when an animal becomes extinct, we can see how it affects the ecosystem. I don't even know what to tell people. How is that going to affect our ecosystem? How is that going to affect how we 
eat and how we should eat, if we, you know, is that going to affect, are we all of a sudden going to see a, a, a emerging illness or a sensitivity to certain viruses or bacteria because it's not in our gut anymore? We haven't been studying it long enough to really know or give that advice. So that actually scared me quite a bit because I don't even know how to respond to that, right? So I think that it probably is helpful and it's probably helpful in ways we don't know, right? If you go through your life and you never develop some issues, will you know? Will you know that you did the right thing, that taking probiotic every day was helpful for you? You won't. We usually are very reactive as opposed to proactive in our society because then we can connect the dots. So I think if out of necessity, so I think, I guess I would answer and, and I by no means do I want to criticize. I'm totally part of the choir boys that is as reactive as possible. That's the game of modern medicine, right? Because we're just learning how to be proactive slowly, but surely. But I think as we are, it's going to be more important to do that. Our understanding of the microbiome is I think it's in its toddler phase and we are connecting it with a lot of different diseases a lot of different bacteria either protection or encouraging toward or uh, a sensitivity to potentially have a uh, certain disease states and we're noting correlation so right now we're in our pattern recognition phase but for some, we're farther along than others. For example, in the gut, we have definitely correlated that a probiotic is very helpful to prevent antibiotic-induced diarrhea. It's very helpful to be protective against and to prevent flares of inflammatory bowel syndrome, which in contrast, irritable bowel syndrome is much more intense and far more dangerous could be even life-threatening, as well as lead to cancer and all sorts of other side effects long-term. So these are things, uh, diseases like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So we definitely know there is an absolute connection but now we know there's a microbiome in your lungs there's a microbiome in your sinuses there's a microbiome on your skin you know i can't wait to be able to go down to sprouts and get something and just smear it on my face and get rid of my acne or what have you that's going to be amazing and that too shall happen but that's a, a matter of you know part of it is we need to know what to do i think it definitely doesn't hurt and for the people who are more pro-reactive in their health, I would absolutely recommend doing that. For people who are more reactive and just don't have the time and energy to do all these things, they don't want to take another pill or anything like that, you know, it depends on how severe the symptoms are, as you said. I will say that if people start taking a probiotic and they have intolerance to it, which is probably my biggest complaint and side effect, they'll start taking it and the, well, things got worse or now I have diarrhea that's all the time. You know, that's probably because their gut is not even used to normal bacteria and their flora is terrible. So what I recommend is that they take a capsule form and try and dilute it with a non-carbonated fruit juice and then see what they can tolerate. Start low and then very, very slowly build up because they're literally have a, probably a terrible gut that they can't even tolerate what's on the marketplace. So yeah, it's a tough time if they end up being in that position, but I think it's more because they're so far down the line versus anything else, right? It's like, when you get into that position where you have to be reactive because you're just on the edge of something so terrible, then it definitely makes sense that that's why 
you have to go to those extreme measures and that's why your body might be responding in such an extreme way as well. And what I'm interested about is too is that if we add in this probiotic, we're starting to see some improvements, but we're still getting the occasional flare-ups from time to time. Would it be worth trying to dig into our diet a little bit more to see what the potential culprits might be? And then, as you mentioned, starting maybe by reducing those or eliminating those. Something that's great with the clients that I work with is usually when they get started with myself, we put them on some form of structured nutritional protocol, right? So they're not so crazy diverse with the foods that they had before, which are super ultra processed. And then maybe when they start to go out for a social event for the first time, or they start open up for a little bit more flexibility, they bring back in foods that they haven't had for a while. And then they're like, ah, oh, wait, that's, you know, I'm feeling a little bit more bloated than I was. And they were able to identify their problem. So is it sometimes a good thing to say, okay, well, if this doesn't, if I have a suspicion that this doesn't work for me to just bring it out or reduce it down for a little period of time? I absolutely think that that's the right thing to do. And maybe that's when I start getting into diaries. But if it's all the time, every day, sometimes a diary is like, what didn't I do? You know, it's like all day long, I can't not eat, you know, which is part of the problem with these things is you have to eat to live. What am I doing wrong? So when we're totally, you know, and I love that when people have more, when we get into the part of time when we're more flaring than we are all the time day in day out it's much easier to pin down it's like okay that's when you have to sit down and tell me everything you did four hours before that flare started and everything you ate and then we can start to work with that and and also like you said then you start backing up a little bit and sl and you know slow ease into that increase don't go full out even if at first you're doing fine don't don't go crazy yeah it's hard to be patient isn't it <laughs> yeah totally and do you go down the route of looking at people's lifestyles as well i know personally if i'm experiencing more stress than usual more kind of volatile emotions my digestion takes a huge hit and it's very very visible and it's very easy for me to identify that and i know a lot of people can relate with that too and also on the same side if people are maybe not sleeping so much so realistically their body is working on overdrive to just about do their daily bodily functions do you look into that aspect as well because realistically sometimes just someone getting better sleep and managing their stress could be a big solution to many of their problems i can imagine Elliot, you're a genius. Can I adopt you? <laughs> you sound like me during a first patient visit. Yeah, I look at everything. I mean, that's, to me, in my opinion, that's part of my job, uh, like you do in yours, is you look at everything the patient is doing. So if they're smoking, that's greatly impacting their sinus microbiome, for example. And no wonder they're having issues. And sleep is so important if i even hear anything that sounds like a sleeping issue i'll want to send someone for a sleeping study potentially help them manage their weight get a little bit more information because it is so fundamentally important for everything to sleep and it leads to so many medical problems that are prevented by just sleeping, like atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure, you know, being miserable in many ways, you know, depression, anxiety. I know when I don't get sleep, I'm depressed. So it, it comes out right away for me. So if someone has that long term, that's something to really, boy, near and dear to my heart is my sleep. But then you also mentioned stress. And boy, have we done this to ourselves or what? everything's worse than stress. So let me tell you a funny story that wasn't funny when it first happened, but it's a very funny story and it's very illustrative of how powerful our brains are, Elliot, is one day I walked into the room of a patient and she was going to get an injection, but not by me. And so I just walked in to say hello and make sure she was good, see what was going on. I was going to visit with her. I had no intention of doing anything like give her a shot. She passed out. Thankfully, she was sitting on my patient examining bed and her blood pressure was almost not detectable. 
and mm-hmm. think about what that takes to do for the body. You know, we, we go to for years to school, uh, medical school, to learn how that can happen. But someone did that just, just with that stress reflux, and then their brain went crazy and did this to us. I cannot believe how fast that was. But things like that happen all the time. So stress is huge. And it's one of the... It's, it's probably the most common reason people end up having to see me is some stressor happened and then now they have hives or some stressor happened and now they have skin symptoms or eczema or dermatitis or their asthma becomes less controllable or now they have an infection. It's amazing. I would say it's the number one comorbidity I see as a reason that tip the scale. You know, and and people, you know, we generally have, you know, just to differentiate, I, I see a lot of that hives, people have headaches, all these things. Once they cross that threshold with a stressful time period, they're always going to be a patient for that. You know, they're always going to be a hives patient. They're always going to be a headache patient. But managing stress also should be regarded as a prophylactic issue. Our mental health is so important. And I've taken upon myself to ask people, which is new for me because I just I just normally do it, but I hug people. I hug my patients and I make sure that they know they should get 10 hugs a day. And it's so important. Our communication, our affection for each other, our social, all the things that reduce stress. And you you actually should now take over this interview because you're an expert on this. This is all this is all your area, exercise and managing diet and all these things are stressors. And we are so bad at it. And it's I think it's probably the number one way we could save ourselves. And now our whole society is you know, stress, we're overstressed, we're overworked, we're overscheduled, and it doesn't have to be this way at all. And we're distant from each other. We're designed to be social creatures, and we're better off that way. So we've really lost a lot of touch with that. So I would love to see that we find ways to manage our stress, you know, and we don't go to, in our you know, in my world, a psychiatrist or a psychologist as a, you know, maybe we need to start making those required visits, you know, before people become teenagers is really give them a greater role because they shouldn't just be around for when we react to things. Now I've got this anxiety issue or major depressive disorder, but I think they're more important than that. They have a lot to teach us. So, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I love that you touched on that as well, because as you mentioned, we're getting overscheduled, we're getting overstressed, overworked, etc. And as you mentioned earlier today, the quality of our ultra processed foods is uh, the quality of our foods will stop is not improving. There is more temptation. There's more ultra processed foods available to us. It's more convenient. Like you said, everyone's looking for those efficiencies as well. So whilst the food system is kind of heading in one direction, our stress is also heading in another direction as well. And neither of us are leading, neither of those things are actually leading to anything good in, a, in any sense of the imagination. So realistically, you know, just as the food is heading in that direction, hopefully we can take a little bit of a, a detour. And the same goes with our mental well-being as well. If we're getting more stressed and more worked and we're not doing anything about it, it's heading in two kind of detrimental directions that are kind of having a bit of a negative and knockout effect to each other. So I love that you've weave that in there and i think as you mentioned if we can start that very very early on in someone's lives i can imagine you do that with your kids as well i'm sure they go out the door every morning with as many hugs as they can well at least the one that's still at home (laughs) yeah absolutely it's critical critical yeah absolutely yeah i'm glad that you touched on that and as we have just about touched on the food intelligence as we have touched on the food intolerances and the allergies in a fair detail i want to now transition into the toxicity as we just mentioned too so in regards to the food toxicity where do we get started with this obviously we might be fighting a bit of a losing battle when we grew up in a household where maybe 
having organic food wasn't accessible or it just wasn't convenient to cook food from scratch. Like you said, you've been a mother of is seven, right? Mm -hmm, that's right. Yeah, a mother of seven, which is, you know, a very, very full household. So to try and keep up with the demands of all your children and your life and everything along those lines, whilst also trying to put healthy food on the table, it's going to be a challenge for anyone, both, you know, from a time perspective, from a, a cost perspective, from all different types of perspectives. So where do you get started with getting the right food on the table for the kids, for yourselves, and avoiding food toxicity that's in and around us everywhere. Yeah, I think it's hard to completely avoid it. And I don't ever want any mother to be listening to this and feel guilty. There's no reason. Mothers are the most important people in our lives and they should remain so. And they are the most wonderful people in our lives. A lot of this has built up over time. And again, very good intentions were behind it. So I don't want there to be any criticism. So some of it we can't help. So let's talk about that first is one, we, we can't help if we don't know it. Aspartame several weeks ago was declared in America as a toxic product, but it has been in Europe for a long time. And so keeping those things in mind, and those are published, I have notations of both the American and the European equivalent of agencies that do research on toxicity and what they're acknowledged likely related to a toxicity or absolutely known related to a toxicity of some sort noted all the known chemicals that we could come up with that play a role in food but also there's things like just living so teflon is in our blood supply from use of teflon and i think i read a statistic like 90 percent of us have you know if we took a blood sample now we'd find it in our blood supply which is ridiculous because it's been outlawed for years and years and years not everywhere but it has been outlawed in most places so how does that happen well it, it builds up in the in the water supply if you think about it the food chain it you know it starts with the lowest on the totem pole, the water and the food supply for animals, which starts in food products. And, you know, if if someone eats animal products, then it can build up and we store some toxins in certain organs. We can store it in the liver. We can, you know, break it down in the kidneys. It can get stored in muscle tissue. It can get stored in fat. So then that gets passed on to the food supply or some toxins get stored in plants. And that's a form of food supply issues. Another example is plastics. So plastics in our food supply, in our water, we really just have to start being mindful and taking it back. So one thing that I've done is I've gone to glass, <laughs> you know, taking it back. And the less these products are used, the less need for them they'll be. And I hate to say it, that's going to send a message up the corporate chain not to use them. So try and use glass. Try not to use, for example, plastic wraps around the house. The more, you know, the more they're in our waste supply, the more they're going to get dumped in the oceans, the more they're going to. Being an advocate for the environment, knowing that a government was permitted to dump radioactivity in a large water supply gives me chills, Elliot. Do we know what that's going to do? And okay, it was a one-off, right? But when's the next time that that's going to have to happen? So, you know, I encouraging all that to move forward, encourage, getting involved, saying things to your, you know, politicians and the people that make these decisions. I, I understand where they're coming from, but now... You know, and mistakes happen. How would we know? But now we need to alter our course and we need to alter it readily sooner than later. And so coming up with alternatives, using the small time farmers that are organic, 
using the, you know, perhaps the, there's a lot of, I don't know if you see it around where you are, but I see this like on a daily basis. These food companies that sell organic, fresh made food, they usually really try to have biodegradable packages. They try to have an exchange program where you're not using plastic bags. I love that Sprouts charges me every time I use one of their plastic bags because that reminds me that I shouldn't be doing that. I should come up with a better solution. So these are all excellent moves forward and everyone's contributing to it and it's starting. So taking advantage of those and where you see it, encourage. That's where you should shop. That's where you should be because that's that's going to be where the money goes and that's going to send that message. So in everything that you do and everywhere you can, with what touches your food, be cautious and look at the toxins. It's ridiculous. The list is just overwhelming. But do one thing at a time and don't be overwhelmed. Bite off a piece of the elephant. What are you going to do today? The first thing I did was when at all possible, I try not to use any type of plastic to drink water. And I don't like that for my family. So I'll, you know, I'll buy you whatever you need, glass or, you know, the Starbucks containers that are, re whatever you need, you know, however expensive it is, I'll, I'll get that for you. But try not to use plastic as much as possible, minimize that. And then move forward from there. So that's what I did in my own life. And we've started doing different programs where our meals and, you know, I need convenience. So I picked a company that does organic. And then I have another company that I go to once a week and they have farm fresh organic fruits and vegetables. And I bring that home. And so, but I didn't do this overnight. So it was one thing at a time. What can you aspire to do today? And it's not perfect. Am I addressing everything? No, but one thing at a time, it's more and more manageable. And uh, my guess is just because people have been more mindful about this, there's gonna be more opportunities to do better in this area soon. And uh, I think they're coming down the pike. And I know my daughter is working on some of them. And I, it just makes me so happy that she's doing this because it's not just going to save the earth. It's not some pie in the sky idea. It's going to probably minimize disease in us. It's probably going to make us a healthier society. So I just love it. Yeah, I can imagine it's really, really profound and deep work. And I want to give a couple of extra takeaways for the listeners as well. So you gave the option of taking away plastic as much as you possibly can, also opting for organic as much as you can. If you had to add three more to the list, what would those be? Either taking away, like not doing, or adding in and doing. So organic and plastics. And then I would say buy food as fresh as possible. Um, so, you know, in, in my household, I sh can shop once a week. And so what I do is instead of having old food or aged food, I end up, uh, chopping it up, process it, put it in the freezer, make sure it's as fresh as possible for my family so that we don't really need to use all these chemicals that end up keeping things fresh. Uh, and preserving food. You know, then finally, I, I would say be mindful of where you shop uh, for food and how they, how do they handle their groceries? Where do they get it from? And that is a very important, very important key is where are you getting it? And, you know, I want food that is, if I don't take care of it right away, it's going to rot because it doesn't have all sorts of things to keep it fresh falsely. I don't want to have dyes in my food. You know, it's great when salmon is like bright red. I know it looks pretty, but you have to wonder, is that the real natural color of salmon? No. And, and school yourself. So I'm going to give you a, an additional one is educate yourself about those sorts of tricks that grocers use. And 
really fight against it. It's like, is that really the color of that food? Or could I have been duped by a dye, you know? Yeah, Julie, let me tell you about this. I discovered this yesterday when I was going to interview a biohacker who's very into optimizing his health as well. And he mentioned that there have been farmers who have noticed that people have picked up on the quality of eggs. And when, of course, the yolks are a deeper orange, maybe closer to a red, we associate that with high quality eggs. A lot of farmers now are putting paprika into the diets of their hens in order to make the yolks darker. Yeah. Isn't that scary? You know, I don't know if it hurts them, but, you know, that's the level at which we're dealing with. And let's just accept things the way they are. And then there will be no need for anyone to do that. I love your biohacker. That's amazing. Yeah, it blew my mind. I was glad he was bringing that to the attention of people. And I'm probably going to mention it a few more times on the podcast for as many people to clock onto that. Because it is, you think of, you know, you associate these things as healthy. But like you said, when they look almost too pristine yet they're not coming from a super pristine place if you're not seeing it in you know a butcher or somewhere that sells fresh fish on a market and it's in your supermarket and it's not in like your organic session then you probably do have to start thinking about well is it really supposed to look like that so i liked that that point that we closed on but with that being said this has been a true masterclass on everything food intolerance allergy toxicity as well and i want to wrap up with a final couple of questions for you and the first one I want to ask is, what impact do you want to have on the world with the work that you do, Julie? I would like to help as many people as possible. I'm a healer and in every way possible. And, and that includes mental health, even though that's not my niche or my specialty. I would love to heal the world. That's, you know, every single human being. I wish I could, you could feel the love that I have for you and know we all truly love each other and we're truly here to help each other. And I want people to know that too. So that's, that's my number one goal. Amazing answer. I love it. And where is the best place for people to find you if they want to keep up with the work that you do or get your book even? Right. So it's available on Amazon and Kindle. It will be available in Barnes and Noble soon. And they can just Google what's eating our kids and they'll come up with what's eating our kids, a parent's guide to food allergy intolerance and toxicity. I have uh, on my website, uh, relieveallergyaz.com, connections to my different blogs and my Twitter and my Facebook and LinkedIn and all that jazz. So I look forward to bringing as many people into uh, healing as possible. And I hope to do it. Absolutely. And do you have an audiobook version of your book? I do. That's actually, I take that back. We don't have it yet, but we will. It's coming down the pipe. Amazing. Perfect. Perfect. I'm glad to hear. So thank you so much for your time, Julia. This has been a fascinating conversation. I really do appreciate you sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. It's been fun.